Thank you, Michael. Um, ben Cave uh, is a specialist in health and social impact assessment, very active in uh, IAI, and uh, he, uh, he, he, his session topic was uh, uh, <laughs> hold on a moment. Um, was the uh, was the health impact assessment uh, session? Uh, there was the, like yep. There was some there. We the um, the official title was uh, I would like to say rebranded as health impact assessment. The official title was special topics in EIA and climate change decision making. Um, we were lucky to have uh, again three excellent speakers. Um, Craig David, when I opened up the, the this panel session, reminded us of the of the wake up call we got from the floor from. Um, the First Nation lady, and she came and spoke in our session uh, and spoke very powerfully of the effects uh, which uh, her family and her people are, are experiencing now in, in Northwest Territory in, in Canada. Um, some of the quotes I scribbled down was, I want to see change and I want to see it now. And she also thanked us. She thanked us for being so committed to this and for letting her speak and coming to listen to her. So while there was real, uh, th some very clear messages coming through of a way of life changing, she described how um, they used to have to dig graves with jackhammers into the permafrost, and now, now the graves are easy to dig and fill up with water, how the food rots, how animals' migratory patterns are changing, um, how hunters are getting lost on flows of ice. So huge changes, um, which she described very, very powerfully for us. We then heard from Alex de Sherbanin, who was speaking about um, resettlement due to climate change adaptation projects, um, and gave us some figures of uh, resettlement, which, uh, and this was acknowledged, and I think, and some things came from a, a meeting in, in Bellagio, which has happened just recently, um, and there are some interesting uh, reports available on the web. Alex is sitting just there, if you want to grab him and ask him questions. Um, the, in uh, 15 million people a year displaced, um, and that's per year in this decade, from 2000 to 2010, and that's up, um, that's up from 10 million in the previous decade. 15 million people d displaced by uh, infrastructure projects, uh, and that compares to 30 million people displaced from, from conflict, violence, and war. So that puts, that puts into perspective some of the, the movement of population caused by uh, infrastructure projects. The, uh, he made a strong case that uh, resettlement should become part of impact assessment and that if you're looking at impact assessment and factoring climate change in, you also need to factor in the effect on uh, human movement as well. Um, and acknowledge clearly this is a highly sensitive topic which uh, governments and proponents may not be keen to talk about. Uh, but it's, but it's uh, made a strong case that, it, that we should talk about this and this should be on the table. Uh, we finally heard from um, Nick King, um, who is the chief exec of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility in Denmark. Um, and again, another forceful case of, uh, of what is happening to, uh, as Nick put it, all the, all, all, the, all the other species on the planet, so including us, but all the other species as well, that stocks are, stocks are tumbling uh, and that habitats aren't static. So if we're, if we're planning for change, do we, play, do, we, do we look at the situation now or do we, do we plan for the, for the change which we, thought, which we see as potentially happening? Um, I notice Fernando is now going to tell us about cumulative impact assessment. One of Nick's points was that cumulative impact assessment is, is essential, that doing things project by project is not enough. Um, and finally, the point, uh, a final clear point is that the need to, to have eco-based system adaptation. So pouring concrete is not a way to, to, to solve a problem. We need to look for softer measures and start using biodiversity, start working with biodiversity um, and building that into what we do. Thank you, Ben. Um, Fernando Loyaza uh, coordinates the SCI, SCA pilot program of the Environment Department at the World Bank. And the session that uh, he chaired was SCA and cumulative impacts uh, case studies. Thank you, West. We have also uh, four presenters in our session. 
The session started by uh, a discussion on cumulative impact assessment led by a presentation by Norval Collins. He focused on a case in Northern Canada and uh, what he identified is that um, climate change is not included in to the EI regulations and barely limited included into project preparation for very large mining projects. At the same time, uh, it, it seems that the uh, local communities, the Nuba, Ut, uh, I hope is, I am pronouncing correctly, at the same, are suffering the effects of climate change, while this is not really uh, connected with what is going on with the regul regulations and the way the industry is behaving. So the conclusion is, is clear. There is a need to fill that void, to, 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 to close that bridge. But it seems that political resistance and bureaucracy resistance are on the way. So that, that was the, the introductory uh, or the first presentation. Then we have uh, Anjanet Glober moving uh, a little bit uh, ahead in terms of a strategic discussion to analyze the case of the preparation of a climate change plan in Michoacan. He started by say, oh sorry, she started by saying that Mexico is, is, is one of the countries that has a good climate performance in index. It ranks eighth in the world. And what she highlighted is that uh, so far uh, there are two states in Mexico that have completed a climate change adaptation plan. But that was prepared mainly with a technocratic approach and uh, mainly by academics. And that was considered a limitation by the government and other stakeholders. And that experience, that didn't, they didn't want it to repeat in Michoacan. So then they decided to use an SEA approach because SEA includes not only analysis, but the process of participation. And she discussed it, that, that process. She highlighted, for example, that uh, one of the limit, although the process of participation it, it's, is rich and important, it was hard at the time of discussing priorities, unless you have good science, as, as, as uh, she said. Finally, she discussed how the, the process is evolving. It's not yet complete, but it's fairly advanced, and uh, indicated that the, through this process, uh, priorities for adaptation have been uh, already more or less selected, and which include, uh, to begin with, no regret measures that were identi identified through, through the process, which can be undertaken anyway, and it's a, a plus for, for, for the state. The next presentation was by Helena Alnaber. It was about a country environmental analysis in Indonesia. She uh, mentioned how by doing this type of analysis, climate change has been chosen as a priority and included into the development strategy of Indonesia. She discussed the use of uh, environmental degradation as a tool for uh, uh, highlight, um, indicating, uh, uh, selecting, sorry, priorities and also indicated that the, 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 the process allowed to identify some adaptation options on land use, energy options. And again, there was a, a, a clear indication that the first thing to do was to identify the no regret options and have a plan to address them, which seems to be a, a, a sensible way of going ahead. And uh, that was highlighted there. And also, in terms of results, it was mentioned that coming from this CEA, a development policy loan for uh, supporting Indonesia's uh, uh, government efforts in development and management of climate change is being currently prepared. Uh, the final presentation was in Orissa, a state in India, which was done by uh, Upendra Behera and Mutu Kumara Mani, mainly by, by Upendra Behera, who is the principal secretary in the Home Department of Orissa. 
he mentioned that uh, India is a low emitter. It has 4% uh, of total greenhouse emissions are coming from there. But the potential of this to increase is significant, as at least 400 million of people is living there without access to electricity. In this case, also, an SEA uh, type of approach is being used to prepare a plan. It was highlighted that it's not an SEA of a plan, but the use of SEA approaches to prepare a plan. And in this case, it's mainly type of a bottom-up approach in which the, 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 the <clears throat> analysis and the recommendations for the plan come from the, from the base and go towards uh, the, the, the decision-making levels. So he described extensive consultations, how uh, multi-sectoral committees were set up, and uh, how uh, also adaptation and mitigation actions were uh, I, uh, identified and considered into this process. And he highlighted that uh, this was a, a part of a process of learning but a successful learning in the sense that uh, it seems that most of the states in India are going to follow in this type of approach in preparing their climate change. Then we came to the, to the part of the discussion, which was very rich. There was discussion about institutional issues, the use of information, the, the science level to inform these processes. And I think I, I, I would like to finish uh, or to complete this presentation by quoting, and I hope uh, more or less accurately, what uh, Mr. Uh, Upendra Behera, the principal secretary, said, which is that participatory and inclusive process are as important as scientific information, and both have to be there to have a sound climate change plan, and that the SEA process is a good way to address these challenges. Thank you.